Firstly, they subdivided provinces. Um, so that where there had been a handful of provinces across the empire, now suddenly there were dozens of provinces. And the reason for this was that it deprived provincial governors of the resources to rebel. So this was an outcome of the problem of civil wars. But it was a complexification, because every, pro every province now had to have an administration that duplicated uh, all of the other administrations in every other province. So you went from a handful of administrations across the empire to dozens of them. Uh, they greatly expanded the size of the government. We have figures of increasing the bureaucracy by something like 30,000, which was a lot for an ancient state. It doesn't seem like much today, but in an ancient state, uh, increasing the bureaucracy by 30,000 employees was a pretty significant step. Uh, they expanded the number of capitals, seats of government, so that rather than simply having Rome as a capital, now there were anywhere from two to four at a time. Um, Constantine, of course, established Constantinople as a new capital in the east, now the city of Istanbul. Uh, Rome continued as a capital in the west, but there was also a capital city often at Trier. There was a capital at Milan. Later on, there was a capital at Ravenna. And of course, every one of these capitals had to have a full complement of palaces and furniture and servants and so forth. They also doubled the size of the army, and this was probably the biggest cost. Uh, and this was the thing that they really needed to do the most. They increased the proportion of cavalry because they needed to be able to move rapidly to contain incursions across the frontier. Uh, cavalry are very expensive. Horses are expensive. They're much more expensive than foot soldiers. Um, all of this was inflationary, and the Emperor Diocletian tried to freeze prices. He issued a famous document called the Edict on Maximum Prices, uh, which was widely ignored, but we benefit from it today because it gives us an idea of what the government thought prices ought to be and an idea of what relative prices were. It's really a wonderfully detailed document. It'll give you the relative value for different kinds of wine, it will tell you what is the value of a woolen cloak from Britain versus the value of a woolen cloak from somewhere else. It's really a wonderful document if you're an ancient historian. Um, the government was dealing with a declining population, and so critical occupations were made hereditary. Now think back to the element of complexity that consists of organization control and regulation of behavior. And you can see that going on in trying to freeze prices, making critical occupations hereditary. Farmers were tied to the land. This, of course, was the single most critical uh, occupation because farmers paid the bulk of the taxes. Um, and then they had to raise taxes to pay for all of this. Uh, this wasn't free. It was higher complexity, and of course it wasn't free. Uh, taxes may have doubled by 300 A.D., and then it looks again like they doubled by about 364. From some documents that we have that come from a little later, slightly later time periods, um, we know that taxes took from a fourth to a third of gross yields. But this was in an ideal year. One of the reforms of Diocletian was that every unit of land across the entire empire was assessed for the production it was supposed to achieve every single year, and the tax was based on that expected production rather than actual production. So if you had a bad year, sometimes taxes took all of it. Even if you had a good year, um, you could only expect to keep um, perhaps a third to a half of your surplus, the rest would go to the government. I once did a back of the envelope calculation trying to figure out what was the energy equivalent in petroleum that it took to run the Roman Empire. And I think I came up with something like a, a half tablespoon of petroleum per square meter per day, something like that. So that's, that's what a Roman peasant family had to live on um, and also what the Roman Empire had to survive on because they took about 50% in taxes. This is a very high tax rate for a peasant population. So the tax system assessed every field across the empire and then also assessed individuals. There was a poll tax on every individual. Localities were expected to provide men for the army. Uh, they didn't exactly have a draft, but each locality was simply expected to put up a number of young men every year for the army. Uh, if taxes didn't get paid, villages were held liable for the taxes on their members. 
Uh, one village could even be held liable for another. And the government never gave up. Uh, tax obligations were extended to widows and orphans and even to dowries. All of this had consequences, as you might expect. This is a very heavy tax burden on a peasant population. Um, population declined. There had been some very bad plagues in the second and third centuries, particularly in the 160s AD, uh, when a plague went through the empire that may, that may have carried off as much as a fourth to a third of the population. And population was not able to recover after this to the level that it had been at before, which meant that there were shortages of labor in many critical areas. This is why the government froze people into hereditary occupations, particularly the occupations that were critical to, to the government and to the army. The tax rates were so high that peasants were not able to accumulate reserves or support large families, and this is why population did not recover. Uh, and, and one reads horrifying accounts of peasants actually selling their own children into slavery because they couldn't feed them, um, or going to the cities to look for food because they didn't have any left for themselves on their farms. With these sorts of problems, marginal lands went out of production. Um, they, they simply couldn't yield enough for taxes and a surplus, even though the government didn't allow this. The government continually tried to force farmers to cultivate all of the land. And then, of course, there were continued fiscal problems, as you would expect. Uh, there was another currency reform in 296, which introduced a new large coin that today we call the Follis. Uh, it started out as a really good size coin, about, I don't know, about the size of a silver dollar or so. Um, these things feel really hefty in your hand. Um, it, but it was primarily a bronze coin with a silver wash, and the silver wash would quickly wear off in circulation. But you can see what happened to it. Um, they weren't able to maintain the weight continually debasing, devaluing the level of the currency. Now, these debasements, of course, were inflationary, and we have some data on inflation. This is the price of wheat in Egypt at various points in time in the uh, early through the mid-fourth century AD. And some of these accounts sound like 1930s Germany, with people having to make purchases by carrying around sacks of coins. So what was the cost to the Romans of being sustainable? Because this is what they were trying to do. They were trying to sustain their empire as a political institution, and also they were trying to sustain Greco-Roman civilization, which they saw as being threatened. Uh, the reforms were very costly because of the increase in complexity. Uh, the empire taxed citizens very heavily, conscripted labor, and regulated occupations. Um, peasants couldn't pay taxes, so often they would abandon their land and go to work for a wealthy landowner who would then protect them. Uh, lands were abandoned and population declined, and the wealthy often got themselves out of paying taxes. So the Roman Empire survived the third century crisis, but it survived by consuming its capital resources, which was producing lands and peasant population. They went from living off interest which would be yearly agricultural production to living off their capital, which was the land and the peasants themselves. And so the collapse was inevitable, and the collapse came from the effort to solve their problems. Now, there are a number of sustainability lessons that come out of the Roman Empire case, and I'd like to go through these briefly. Um, in popular discourse and even in academic discourse, it's often it often seems as if people think that sustainability somehow emerges as a passive consequence of consuming less. That if we simply all drive hybrid cars and take colder showers or use public transportation or grow local food and so forth and so on, we'll become sustainable. Um, I tell my students, and they don't like this message, but I tell my students that conservation alone does not produce sustainability. I don't want to say anything against conservation. I don't want to downplay the value of conservation. I think conservation is very valuable, but conservation alone does not produce sustainability. Sustainability is an active condition of problem solving. A society has to have resources to solve problems. 
problems are not solved simply by conservation. And we see this clearly in the case of the Roman Empire. You can also see it in the recent financial crisis. Uh, complexity is a problem-solving tool, including the problems of sustainability. Complexity is an economic function with benefits and costs, and it can reach diminishing returns. Complexity in problem-solving can reach diminishing returns. Here's one of the really hard ones to swallow. Sustainability may require greater consumption of resources, not less. If you understand that sustainability is a function of problem solving, sustainability may actually require greater consumption of resources, not less. And we see this very clearly in the case of the Roman Empire. Um, complexity in problem solving does its damage subtly, unpredictably, and cumulatively. Uh, when you're encountered with a problem, the solution usually seems incremental and affordable. It's the cumulative costs um, that ultimately do you in. And perhaps most disturbing of all is that a society or other institution can be destroyed by the cost of sustaining itself. Which leads us to the question, can we overcome limits? Can we overcome the kind of problems that were faced by the Roman Empire? Uh, we've had a belief, almost a faith, that we can always overcome problems through innovation, particularly through technological innovation. This is, this is something deeply seated in each of us. We all, we all grew up thinking this, that we can always overcome our problems. We're a creative society. All we need to do is just turn people's creativity loose and, and our problems will all be solved. And I'd like to talk about this for a few minutes because I believed it once too. Toward the end of World War II, uh, President Roosevelt asked Vannevar Bush, who was the director of the wartime Office of Scientific Research and Development, to draft a report on the post-war role of government in promoting science. He wrote a famous report titled Science, the Endless Frontier, and in it he wrote, advances in science will bring higher standards of living, will lead to the prevention or cure of diseases, will promote conservation of our limited national resources, and will assure means of defense against aggression. This is an example, a, a classic example, of our faith in innovation and our faith in technology. And it continues to this day. Uh, recently, Stephen Chu, Dr. Stephen Chu, the US Secretary of Energy, testified before Congress by saying, scientific and technological discovery and innovation are the major engines of increasing productivity and are indispensable to ensuring economic growth, job creation, and rising incomes for American families in the technologically driven 21st century. Innovation as we know it today is a recent development. Uh, innovation is not a characteristic are not a common characteristic of human history. Um, in human history, looked at over the long term, there have been long periods of little or no technological change, of stasis, sometimes lasting even hundreds of thousands of years in what's called the Paleolithic or the Old Stone Age. In contrast today, we have institutionalized innovation uh, with short product cycles and continuous new introductions of updates and upgrades and new and better gee whiz things. Um, and overall, industrialized nations allocate about 3% of their gross domestic product to research and development. And today we hear a lot of calls to increase that amount. Uh, in the budget review that's going on in England, uh, the scientists successfully lobbied the government not to cut science uh, as much as uh, they're going to have to cut other parts of their government because of this belief that innovation uh, is the key to future prosperity. Um, so today, economic well-being depends on innovation. Firms that don't innovate can't compete. Uh, 
and nations that don't innovate also cannot compete. 